Hello there, everybody, and welcome to yet another exciting and edifying fall publishing webinar. I am Chris Beatty, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next 90 minutes or so as we tackle today's topics, neonics, should you keep them or drop them? Now, you'll notice that this says it's an encore presentation. You may be aware that we presented this webinar last Tuesday. But, and it was attended by more than 300 industry folks, one of our biggest webinars ever, but many still weren't able to attend. So I asked our uh, four experts if they would uh, be willing to do another one, and they graciously agreed to this encore presentation. Uh, now, I will also admit that due to a, a setting error that I made, there was a lot of beeping in the background last week uh, due to folks having to, uh, to phone in for the audio instead of just listening through your computer like you are now. And um, so that would have been distracting in our recorded archive. So there's going to be no beeping this time, I hope, and uh, we're going to archive this presentation for future uh, viewing. Now, this webinar, real briefly, is going to look at four different things, the history and the politics of the neonics situation, uh, alternative products you can use in case you decide to stop using neonics uh, or the decision is forced upon you, um, and some real-world case studies from two growers, both of whom eliminated neonics from their production, and one of whom uh, is actually bringing them back after a year without them. So I'll stop talking, and let's introduce the first of our four experts. He is uh, Mr. Joe Bischoff, the Regulatory and Legislative Affairs Director for American Hort. Welcome, Joe. Hey, Chris. How are you today? Great. And uh, where are you broadcasting from today, Joe? Because one of the fun things about a webinar, as I always like to say, is, is you can do it from, from anywhere where you've got a, a laptop and an Internet connection. That's right. Last week I was in my car uh, on my way to a meeting with USDA and pulled over to the side and was able to do it. But this time I'm actually kicking back and relaxing on a rainy day in Washington, D.C. from my office. So happy to join you. One of the rare moments when you're in your office. Good. Glad to That's hear right. it. All right. Next up, uh, our resident academic on our panel today, longtime Grower Talks contributor, and he happens to also be a Kansas State University professor in his spare time, Dr. Raymond Cloyd. Welcome, Ray. Welcome, Chris. How are you? I'm fine. And uh, Kansas State University, you're broadcasting from Kansas State? Yeah, the Little Apple, Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> the Little Apple. All right. Okay. Now, the uh, the first of our two growers from Green Circle Growers in Overland, Ohio, Renato Zardo. Welcome, Renato. Hello, Chris. Hello, everybody. Glad to have you here. Now, now, Renato, you are broadcasting from Overland, Ohio, correct? That's correct. Same as okay. last week, but now if I spring weather. Yeah, oh, well, that's that's a nice thing. It's getting warm. But but that's not an Ohio Valley accent that you're sporting. Where Where are you from originally? I'm originally from Brazil. Ah, that explains it. But And you've got a master's degree in horticulture, no less, so you really know your stuff. Hope so. I'm still learning. We're still learning. <laughs> and speaking of, guy, of a guy who knows his stuff, uh, our the head grower for the very well-known Bell Nursery in Maryland, Mr. Tom Wheeler. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Chris. All right, and you're broadcasting from uh, Maryland, I presume. Yes. Yes, I'm. I'm very close to Joe. I'm. I'm in uh, downtown Burtonsville, Maryland. All right, but but um, you uh, you oversee growers in what four different states now? Is that correct, or is it more? Uh, I believe it's four or five. Yeah, um, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and Ohio, um, and uh, Delaware. So yeah, yeah four so or five growers. Yeah. Five five states and a lot of network growers. That is a lot of insect management. So you really know your stuff when it comes to uh, pests in the greenhouse, I assume. Um, I try, and I and you know I'm always willing to learn more. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the other panelists. It was very interesting last week and uh, great presentations. All right, let's go. Well, and, and as usual, your uh, faithful host is working the controls from the uh, the Ball Publishing Broadcast Studios in West Chicago, Illinois. Hello, everybody. 
And uh, now the first thing we want to have to do is uh, give a special thanks, a shout out to the sponsor of this webinar, Ball Seed Company. They are the ones who put the word free in free webinar. So thank you very much, Ball Seed Company. A couple quick housekeeping things before we dive into the presentation. If you've got questions as we go along, and I suspect you will, use the little chat area that you see on your control panel, type it in there, and we'll either get to it as we go along or uh, we'll save some time at the end, I think. So do that. And uh, if something comes up and you have to leave the webinar or you, the system kicks you off or something, heaven forbid, and you can't dial back in, this webinar will be archived at ballpublishing.com slash webinars. It's the same place you went to, to sign up for it. So, uh, so if we're all set, Joe, you are up front. Take it away, my friend. Sure. Thanks a lot, Chris, and, and thanks for uh, having me on again, and, and, and thank you for those who are, who are attending. Um, so... A little bit, I mean, I'll stick, kick, kick off with a little bit of the history here and, and kind of where we are with this issue on pollinator health and, and, uh, and neonics, obviously. And uh, I mean, no, one's gonna, no one can deny uh, the importance of, of managed honeybees and, and pollinators, uh, you know, both for our environment and for our agricultural crops. Maybe some of you have seen some of this, this, um, the statistics out there talking about uh, approximately one of every three bites comes from uh, comes from food that has been pollinated with a honeybee. Uh, also, uh, you know, adding 15 billion dollars or so in added uh, ag value um, that they bring. So, so they are certainly important to agriculture. But we can't also forget, and it's a reason why this probably is such a hot topic, is there is a, a significant emotional connection to uh, to bees and pollinators. Uh, it's hard to look at them in any other way than how they interact with um, with us in society in, in ag, but also with our environment and pollinating plants, a kind of a synergy. And so they kind of become an indicator uh, for many people to the, the health of our environment. And I think that's why we're seeing so much of a, uh, an emotional connection, connection to this issue. So um, here on, on this slide, you see that there are some, some fairly recent articles, uh, and there have been many more since then, this, uh, kind of calling attention to the idea of bees at the brink, um, you know, the, a bee apocalypse sort of sort of situation, and um, uh, you know, we're going to get into whether or not that's so much that that's so true, but it's clear that just as we market plants and we market material to to bring people to come in, purchase plant material for our industry, um, the media outlets uh, are doing the same thing. They're trying to market and bring readership and listeners and viewers to this topic, and, uh, and it, it definitely pulls on those emotional, uh, emotional strengths. So, so neonics, you know, why are we seeing a lot of attention placed on neonicotinoid? Um, uh, insecticides, uh, it's really, this is a class of, of chemistry. There's about seven or eight different uh, families within there that all act a little differently, um, but that fit within neonics. And we think a big reason why this is getting so much attention is, um, although they've been around since the 1990s, uh, they're, they're really still kind of the new kid on the block with as far as insecticides. In fact, when they came along, it was the first new class of insecticides in about 50 years. Um, and right now, they are the most commonly used insecticide in the world. Now, we don't use, in our industry, we probably use less than 10% of the total. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at lots of crops use them, we see them in seed treatments. Obviously, we're not using them for those purposes, but they're, they're kind of uh, all over the place, uh, you know, as far as they're used pretty frequently and, uh, and we're successful in using them throughout the world. Uh, so getting back to this idea of, of be, a, be apocalypse, major concerns on pollinators. What we have here uh, is it's a graph that you'll frequently see in many talks, but it usually stops at 2007. And you'll see from World War II, um, you know, beginning around 1945 to 2007, you, you generally see this pretty significant decline in the, in the number of uh, managed honeybee colonies. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and and first, in, first among them is likely just our changing demographics. You know, less people working in ag, um, greater, you know, greater urban and suburbanization. Um, also, during World War II, uh, bee wax and, and honey production were deemed as, um, as important or vital to, uh, to our federal efforts in, in, uh, in, during World War II and in the years that, uh, that followed. So since then, it's been really an issue of, of supply and demand. 
Um, and what we see in more recent years is the demand has increased significantly for pollination services. Some of you may have heard of the almond production. Every year, about two-thirds, about 1.8 million hives, two-thirds of our hives in the United States go towards the pollination of almonds in California. For so, um, so where are we right now? Well, really, when you look at the numbers, 2.6 million is, a, is uh, where we are now as far as the numbers. It's, it's about where we were in 1997. So, um, so the reality is it's, it's still continued. The, the, the bees are there. They're still doing Now, it doesn't mean that beekeepers aren't working a lot harder, hustling more to keep those numbers up, because they do have significant challenges, and more than they have in decades past. So how do we find out what are the reasons for, for the beekeepers actually facing more challenges? Um, you know, because as I mentioned, they, it is the reality. They deal with significant winter losses. Also, there are summer and, and fall losses that they have, they're dealing with at greater numbers um, than they have in the past. And really, as an industry, we really need to look to the science and we need to say, where, what's the most comprehensive work out there on this topic? Um, and we can look at the 2012 USDA stakeholder report, 2013 um, report out of the United Kingdom. Um, Australia, basically their, their equivalent of our EPA, put out a report in 2014. And just two weeks ago, um, our Congressional Research Service, the U.S. Congressional Research Service, kind of put out a report evaluating what's out there. And they all really came to the same sorts of conclusions. That basically the, the, the challenges are, are, are broad and diverse, that they have, uh, as I mentioned, changing demographics. Bees are facing forage and habitat loss, and so it means access to, loss of access to food. Uh, in agriculture, we're much more successful now at, um, at, at growing things from hedgerow to hedgerow, fewer weeds. So that certainly uh, makes it tougher and for, for bees to find forage because they utilized the flowers from those, from those weeds. Um, genetic bottlenecking, you know, so the genetic weakness. When we look at bees and in, just as we do look at our, are the plants we grow, um, often they're monoculture or there's a lot of, you know, less genetic diversity. Same thing with bees. So that means they're actually more prone to, to some uh, pests and diseases in some cases. Um, we're having challenges, as I mentioned, parasites and, and disease. So parasites, varroa mite is probably the, the biggest challenge that beekeepers face right now. It's a, a mite that was first introduced or first found in the United States in 1987. Um, we know that it carries, carries some diseases, including viruses that can, uh, that can kill bees. Um, so big challenges there. But we can't also neglect to identify that pesticides are a component, the insecticides in particular. The insecticides we use, well, that means they're, they're meant to kill insects. And uh, bees are insects, so when, the, when they do interact in sufficient quantities, um, there are going to be some bee kills. So these are things that we really need to be thankful, you know, thinking about and be thoughtful about um, moving forward, more, more so than we already are. So, you know, this sort of focus um, on, on neonics and uh, connection also to our industry uh, really began in the United States in, um, in the spring of uh, 2013. Um, maybe all of you or some of you have heard about um, a large bee kill that occurred in Oregon. This, this photo is actually from um, a memorial service that was held at that uh, parking lot where those, those in the backdrop there are linden trees that are covered in kind of a black mesh. Um, those linden trees were in flower and they were sprayed with a neonic uh, during the day. Obviously, this was an off-label application. Many, many bees were killed, um, and these in particular were, were bumblebees. And uh, it created a pretty dramatic setting. And, and just a few miles up the road, about, about 10 miles up the road from where this happened, was Xerces, a conservation, an invertebrate conservation group. Their headquarters was just, was just 10 miles away from this, from this uh, uh, where this occurred. And uh, it kind of became um, a media, it, it gathered a lot of media attention. And basically feeding off of that media attention and that memorial service that was held, uh, we've, we've seen a series uh, of articles and, and, um, and also uh, um, other ways of, of drawing attention to the topic and also highlighting or trying to point the finger at our, at our industry. Um, so there was the, the Time Magazine article that, that came out in the summer of 2013. There was a legislation um, that was uh, offered in the, in the House 
uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives on the Save America's Pollinators Act. And we see a report out of the, and I call it a study in, in quotations because I wouldn't, wouldn't really refer to it as so much a, um, it definitely wasn't peer reviewed and pretty weak science, but uh, there were reports out of groups like Friends of the Earth um, trying to uh, uh, drum up this sort of, you know, this concern about uh, the interaction between pesticides coming from our industry and, and bees. So the challenges are pretty broad and, uh, on this topic for our industry. And when we look at them, um, you know, federal legislation, not so much. I mentioned that one bill um, in 2013 that's actually been reintroduced just recently. Um, but we, we know that it really, that bill will go nowhere. Um, it likely won't even make it out of committee. There likely will be some helpful bills. Um, coming out this, uh, I would say in this session, things that are looking to help um, uh, pollinators and to help uh, uh, the honeybee uh, keepers that in that industry, because uh, there's things that we can do. We can do things about you know forage and habitat, and there's uh, federal lands that can be um, made available for them to basically take their bees uh, and, and uh, revitalize them after doing some of their crop services, pollinator services. So there there will be opportunities to partner with beekeeper groups um, in trying to see this legislation through. Federal regulation, here I have some concern. I'm gonna say that that concern continues to grow. Uh, we do know the EPA has put together some documentation that we expect to be, uh, expect to see reported out sometime this spring, where they start uh, suggesting, it's, it initially it's gonna be a suggestion, because it'll be open for comments, but that the B label, the B box uh, language, that much of that language will be reflected in the actual labels in 2016. And it likely will not pertain just to um, Munich. It's gonna be broader than that. We're talking about the potential of 1,500, 1500 to 1,700 products that would be impacted. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're worried, but we all are also working very closely with EPA um, on this issue and trying to, uh, to make it clear to them um, our, our industry's needs of these products and also um, some of the, the practices that we have in place to make sure that we're reducing the risk of interaction with pollinators. State and local challenges, those are many. Um, many states, many, local, many um, uh, municipalities right now are putting together ordinances and potential laws that could uh, significantly restrict the use of these, uh, of these chemistries. And, um, and, and it's a tough, a tough challenge to deal with because it's, it's got many heads. And so we're doing our best. In fact, on, on, uh, in Maryland, there is a hearing um, uh, in, in Annapolis on Friday that um, some people from our industry and myself included will be participating in and trying to talk about the science and highlighting the science. Because uh, so much of this becomes about uh, the public perception concerns, you know, these sort of the people who are, have a zero pesticide tolerance sort of approach and see, see this as a zero sum game are trying to drive the agenda and saying, hey, it's all about pesticides. And we know that's not the reality. Um, we're trying to make sure we're infusing this with science and say, listen, the science is, is not supportive of that, that really there's a broad range of issues. So in, in retail and in, in regulation through retail, major concern. And really that's where we need to put a lot of focus and making sure that we change the topic on this from being about neonics and about pesticides, really talking about how our industry is part of a solution, both in the forage and habitat, but also, um, you know, there are things that we already do. Um, and can, we can do some more, but there are already things that we do to be part of the solution, um, you know, by providing those, the, the products and the, the plant material that we know bees, um, they, get a lot of, uh, they get a lot of benefit out of. Um, I'll just mention our, uh, also our goal. What's our goal here? What are we trying to do? We want to make sure that we are keeping the tools in the toolkit, right? Right now, the, the science out there supports the use of Munich, saying it, it's safer for our workers. It's, um, it makes us incredibly successful in integrated pest management uh, using biocontrols. Um, it's, uh, it's, effect, it's an effective tool against many of the most significant pest challenges we face, including many invasive species. So we want to make sure, as long as the science stands behind that, that we are keeping those tools available to the industry. So, so where do we go from here? What are the steps that we're taking to try to fulfill that? So here at American Hort, um, we are working closely with, um, with you know, many partners, including Society of American Florists. I have a great colleague over there. Many of you likely know Lynn Schmalley, that she and I work very closely on this topic. Um, and so, so we're, 
we're working on through a, a task force, an initial task force we put together, a set of stewardship practices. And these really get at things like trying to encourage opportunities for expanded forage um, for, for bees and other pollinators. Uh, we are supporting research. So the Horticultural Research Institute um, uh, just, just finished up and should be announcing, I would say, within the week, um, a number of projects that are being funded to tackle some of the uh, some of the questions that we all have regarding uh, what are the plants that we are selling that bees we we know are attracted to and go to regularly, what's the concentration and and uh, of neonics and the pollen and nectar, especially over time, how they decline over time, so we can be a little smarter about how we do these applications. Um, also, some some questions we need answered on need of pollinators or need of bees. I can tell you what we're hearing there from, from many researchers who work in that space is that, that they feel like the populations of native, of native bees in suburban settings are actually pretty darn healthy. And it might be because of largely due to the plant material that we provide. Um, so answering some of those questions. Uh, but also we wanna make sure that, um, uh, that we are partnering. We're looking for the groups and we have, some, have built strong relationships among some of these groups that can identify where they see a need or see a benefit to some of these products but also see our industry as being part of a solution. So we are working closely with some of the beekeeper organizations, the American Beekeeping Federation, the American Honey Producers Association. We're looking to work with some groups who also are very interested in conserving, uh, you know, like in land management, conserving the space, potentially the land that they own, because they're concerned about pests like Asian longhorn beetle, hemlock woolly adelgid, um, emerald ash borer. And these products are really an important tools. So we're looking for those opportunities to collaborate. And some of them, the bridges are continuing to be built. So, so that's kind of the framework, the work we're doing. Um, I can say, uh, as far as, like I mentioned, the research, that will be announced likely within the week. Um, the stewardship program and the practices we have together, there's just a few more T's to cross and I's and, and, and to dot, but we are largely there and, and, and making that a voluntary program that if, if, uh, if growers are feeling a, a sense of pressure, want to be able to do something about that, this is a, a program that they could highlight and say, listen, we hear your concerns and we are doing this. Um, we are per performing our growing practices under these guidelines um, in response and, and helping uh, be part of the solution in pollinators. The reason is we've been dealing with this issue, we're dealing with a sound bite coming at us there's not the opportunity for a robust conversation on this topic. So we want to make sure that we have the, we have the ability to respond almost like a sound bite saying to the consumer, to the activists, we hear your concerns and we're, we're taking action and here's what I'm doing. And this is for people who really feel a sense that they need to have that sort of response. This page, I'd encourage you to, to go and uh, if you can check out this website. Um, this is where we have it's kind of the, the landing page on this topic, but also there are many more, uh, if you go to, Want to know more? There's a, lots of articles associated with this topic. Um, and also, you know, we really hope and we're looking for industry support to help us in this effort. So you can go to this website, click donate, and it will take you to the um, Horticultural Research Institute website and, and provide you the opportunity to be, to help us in, in crafting this message and putting this package together and start turning the tide on this topic. So with that, um, I'll, I just wanted to make sure that you had the contact information for myself and my colleague, uh, Craig Regelberger. And, um, and anyway, I look forward to, to ha answering any questions. Excellent, Joe. And I tell you, folks, these guys are doing yeoman's duty there in Washington and, and other places where they're needed. So we, we greatly appreciate that. Joe, quick question. Uh, when it comes to protecting a grower or retailer's right to choose to use a neonic or not, are you optimistic pessimistic or is it too early to tell right now? Well, I think that, so I'll say first off, the right to choose, I think I am optimistic because I do think we are in the right side of the science here. Um, and, and while we do see some, some chips in the armor of like EPA making some moves that are out of line of their typical process and following the science, um, and that's why we've been submitting comments on things that really range outside of our typical, even submitting comments on soybean benefits, on, uh, on, on some fungicides, but we want to make sure we are trying to make sure in our comments that we are reinforcing to EPA the need to stick with the science. And if they do that, if we can convince the, um, the decision makers to stick with the science, we think that the access to this, to this chemistry will, will be maintained because 
it's a it's an incredibly safe product um, for doing a lot of the things that we need to you know to accomplish. Um, now the public perception piece gets a lot tougher, and that's you know the lift there is much more significant. So whether or not people will make the decision to say we're going to avoid it for forever for the time being, you know, I, I think here in America, we respect the decisions of any of the, any people out there who have to make a business decision and be responsive to their customers. So um, as far as a choice, we think the choice will remain um, and, uh, and we hope over the long term that people can make the decisions that, you know, that are right for their business, but also are right for controlling these, uh, these problematic pests. Yeah. So the social issues will, or pressures will remain, but that applies to all chemicals and, and all of that, I think. All right, Joe, thanks so much. Speaking of science, because you brought that word up several times, let's, let's uh, call on our resident scientist here, Dr. Raymond Cloyd, to find out about the, the, the science behind these chemicals and the alternatives that are available. Take it away, Ray. <clears throat> okay. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, Chris, and um, allowing us to present this for a second time to get the information out. Uh, what I'll be talking about is a little bit sort of what to expect is sort of the background, the neonicotinoids, uh, talk a little bit about their characteristics and some of the benefits of systemic insecticides, and then the alternatives. Um, to me, this is not a neonicotinoid issue, it's a pesticide issue, so I'm going to interchange the use of systemic insecticides and neonicotinoids. Um, so why don't we go ahead and go with the next, the, the next one. Uh, basically, uh, as Joe indicated, the neonicotinoids were, first came out in the mid-1990s. Uh, Imidacloprid, uh, in this case Marathon or Merit, was the first one out of the box. And then from there we had a series of other ones, including thiamethoxam, dinotetron, acetamiprid, and, a, and another one on there is not on the list, clothianidin. Clothianidin is not <clears throat> registered for use in greenhouses. but it is important to understand that clothianidin is a metabolite of thiamethoxam, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that too. But going backward a little bit more, we've had we've had systemic insecticides for many years. I'm sure many of you remember that orthene and temic and vidate were readily available. However, uh, they were very toxic, and so uh, they they got discontinued. And about the same time, the neonicotinoids kind of came in to fill that gap. And we've no we've had systemic insecticides since the 1950s. And as we'll go along, there are some benefits of them. Uh, prior to the introduction of neonicotinoids or any systemics, is that most growers, whether we're talking about outdoor or indoor, were doing foliar applications of insecticides. Uh, many of those contact, and, and there were some issues with those. Uh, residues, worker exposure, uh, toxicity to bees and other organisms, among others, and also the impact on biologic control organisms. So this is just a sort of a listing of the uh, the types that are out there, Marathon 2, TriStar. I do want to say that acetamiprid, uh, which is the, the active in TriStar, is the only neonicotinoid that cannot be applied to the soil. It's the only foliar application. And when you read the literature or hear talks about the neonicotinoids, you'll see that acetamiprid is not considered uh, to be banned. And the reason is because acetamiprid, is not as toxic to the, the uh, as as a neonicotinoid as the others are because it's in a different category. Also, bees can bioaccumulate or biotransfer the material, and the metabolites are less toxic to bees overall. Next one. So, right in the segue. So, what we see here are the neonicotinoids that have two classifications: the n nitroguanidines which includes the midicloprid, thiamethoxin, dinotefron. Uh, these are toxic to bees. When you read the literature. Uh, I've been keeping up with it for five years. Uh, the data is quite substantial under laboratory conditions in most cases that these are toxic to, to uh, honeybees and also bumblebees. The, cyan the cyanoamidine, the acetamiprid, is less toxic overall, and it also has a shorter uh, half-life, which is about 24 hours, than the other neonicotinoids. So uh, the target for these organizations is not the, the acetamiprid tristar, but it's the nitroguanidines because uh, studies have shown definitively, mostly under laboratory conditions, that they can be toxic both orally in most cases and some cases indirectly to both honeybees and bumblebees. So the way the neonicotinoids are classified and, um, is that the, under the IRAC, which is the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee designation, all neonicotinoids have a 4A designation uh, on their label. The active ingredient is their nicotinic acetoreceptor agonist or antagonist, which means they stimulate uh, a mechanism or they inhibit a mechanism from occurring, the neonicotinoids. And then the, uh, four, the five that are in yellow are the ones that would be used in agriculture 
uh, or ornamental systems. Again, clothianidin is not registered for use, but is, it is a derivative metabolite of thiomethoxam. Uh, the other ones are either used in uh, pets or livestock or in uh, fruits and vegetables. So let's talk about the benefits of systemic insecticides and what they were designed to do when they were introduced in the 50s and continue to be introduced 60s, 70s, and 80s, is that they do, one application may protect plants throughout most of the growing season, which then reduces the need for repeat applications. And that's good because it protects workers and customers and also bees and other non-target organisms. Uh, being a closed system where most of these are applied to the growing medium soil, and then the roots take up the active, and then it's moved throughout the plant, or we call it translocated, it's inside the plant. So there's no outside residues involved. And so this decreases any uh, degradation by UV light or rainfall. Obviously, with no spray applications, there's no residues on the leaves that could be harmful to workers and customers. <clears throat> and also, there's no problems with drift compared to foliar applications. And then lastly, <clears throat> there's really minimal direct impact on natural enemies and bees because the active ingredient is inside the plant. Next image. So what are some of the non-neonicotinoid alternatives? And what I'm going to do is the neonicotinoid systemics are targeting the phloem feeding insects. Those are insects such as aphids and white flies and mealybugs, leaf hoppers and soft scales that feed in the flows, flows phloem soup tubes, and that's where they're ingesting or acquiring the active ingredient of the, of the systemic insecticides. So let's talk about uh, some of these potential alternatives based on the pest. <clears throat> well, the first one is aphids. And we have some materials, and these are not exhaustive lists, but they're just examples. And I want to put the caveat out there is this, that many of these are going to have issues regarding less residual activity. They're not going to control the level or spectrum of pests that neonicotinoids do. And these are contacts, which means that thorough coverage of all plant parts and timing of applications is going to be very critical. So Endeavor is a systemic. It's a selective feeding blocker. It works very well in aphids in our studies. Contos is a systemic. It's the only one that moves both up and down the plant. Uh, Hachi Hachi is a contact. And the potassium salts of fatty acids, or what we call them the insecticidal soaps, are also good, but they're contact. And so, they're, again, they're short residual activity, which means repeat applications are going to be required. Next. The oils are also effective at uh, killing them. Uh, Rycar is a new product. Uh, we don't know the mode of action. Orthene's been around for a long time. It does have a very uh, long REI and does have systemic activity. And then the newest one is uh, Mainspring from Syngenta, and it is, it is a systemic insecticide with a very distinct mode of action. We haven't seen this mode of action for quite some time, um, but it is a systemic material that is registered for aphids. What about white flies? Well, white flies, of course, are the same as aphids, phloem feeding insects, produce honeydew, feeding in the phloem sieve tubes. And we do have Endeavor again, but there's another selective feeding blocker. Now, the IRAC designation uh, will vary them differently. I think one is a B or C. They're both nine, basically. Uh, but they have saved the same mode of action, that is selective feeding blockers. This is a physical mode of action where the active uh, basically attacks the neuroregulatory system of the insect in the mouth parts, and they can't feed effectively, and they starve to death. Uh, pretty gruesome. It's pretty cool to see the, the videos on this. Um, Judo is a lipid biosynthesis inhibitor, just like Contos, so they both have the same mode of action. And then again, um, soaps. I mean, soaps are very good, but they have short residual. Thorough coverage of all plant parts required, and repeat applications will be necessary. Next one. The oils, the same, the same thing as the soaps. Now, six and seven, distance and pedestal, are insect growth regulators, which means they only work on the immature stage of the insect, in this case, white flies. Uh, in our studies, both of these are very, very effective uh, IGRs, insect growth regulators. Distance works on the uh, mimics the hormones. It prevents the nymphs from developing to adults. The value on our pedestal, what that does, it disrupts the ability of the insect to develop a, a, a very elastic chitin, which is the skin of the insect, and they basically go up and smoke because they lose water that way. Um, and then the last one is a uh, entomal pathogen of fungi referred to as botanigard. Now, these materials will work, but they require a certain relative humidity and temperature to be effective. But 
we've been working with them more and more and find them to be a lot more effective than people perceive them to be. They're more to use when the plants are small because then you can get very good coverage and the humidity is really conducive. It needs to be over 70%. So these are some options you can think about if you, if you go away from the neonicotinoids. My favorite, they're all my favorite, mealybugs. Mealybugs are, I call them the sneaky pest. Uh, next to thrips, they're the most difficult to deal with. Soaps and oils will work, however, you have to get the crawlers. Once mealybugs are cottony, mass all over the plants, forget about it. Uh, you have to use these materials early on because once they get to bigger life stages, they are basically uh, resilient to most anything. NSTAR, a very good insect growth regulator, but again, you have to apply these on a routine weekly basis. Talus is the same thing. It's another chitin synthesis inhibitor, but multiple applications are required and thorough coverage of all plant parts is critical. Orthene again, orthene, orthene is really interesting. It's got both uh, systemic contact and translander activity. It's the most widely studied insecticide out there. Uh, it will work on mealybugs <clears throat> primarily as a spray. Uh, pyrethroids, and I just put the Cathlon on there, uh, will work, but again, they'll work only on the crawler stages. Now the newest, another new one that came out this year from Dow Agro Sciences is Expire, and it has two different uh, AIs, which means two different modes of action. Spinoteram is very similar to spinosad, which is conserve, uh, which, which that doesn't have any activity on mealybugs. A conserve, that group has no activity on sucking insects. But sulfoxifer is very closely related to the neonicotinoids, but it is not a neonicotinoid, it's a 4C. But it will work as a material against mealybugs. So if you expire, you are getting away from the neonicotinoid, group because it's a 4C. Scales uh, will be the same as mealybugs. Again, soaps and oils will be very effective, but again, you have to make multiple applications. Thorough coverage of all plant parts, and we'll talk about some of the uh, problems there. In addition, you cannot apply soaps and oils too frequently because they will burn plants. And that was another benefit of systemics is that if you get it in, into the roots of the plant, you minimize foliar applications and thus avoid issues regarding the phytotoxicity because many of these materials out there, uh, especially in flowers, can be phytotoxic. And so that's another thing to take, take into consideration. Also, foliar applications are going to enhance the prospects of worker exposure and customer exposure and related residues on plants. And many of these compounds, uh, especially the broad spectrums, will disrupt biologic control. I mean, if you're gonna use soaps and oils on a routine basis, it's gonna be very difficult to establish a sound biologic control program against another insect that you're not targeting with these sprays. Next one. Here's our old friend orthene again. It's registered for about everything. Uh, Instar kinoprene, same as mealybugs, an insect growth regulator, uh, but multiple applications, thorough coverage and timing are critical. And expire again, uh, same as mealy, uh, same as mealybugs, because mealybugs and scale are pretty much uh, very synonymous in both their behavior and their biology and their life cycles. Okay, now fungus gnats I put on here because many of the neonicotinoids are registered. However, uh, there are alternative materials that you don't even need neonicotinoids overall, and we have some really great biologicals. I think the nematodes uh, are very effective when applied. Uh, prior, to an, an, prior to an infestation developing or being established. Uh, a predatory roll beetle we've been rearing for 15 years, uh, Delosia coriara is very effective against all life stages of the, the fungus ads. That includes eggs, larvae, but not the adults because they're above the ground. Uh, and then the predatory mite, which is uh, Stradiolus simitus, has also worked very well. But there are also some insect growth regulators that we've been, we've been working with for many years, and distance is one of the standouts. Uh, it does very well against fungus net larvae. Now these are all on fungus net larvae, which is in the growing medium. The adults are, are, very, are a different story. So another, two other insect growth regulators, Citation has worked very well. Adept, Adept does work well, but you've got to be careful. You can't apply it, you cannot apply it to poinsettias, Rieger begonias, or hibiscus because of potential phytotoxicity. 
They're both chitin synthesis inhibitors, and in our studies, they've been shown to be very effective against uh, fungus ant larva when applied early on in the crop production cycle. Pylon is another one. It, it, we've gotten great results of pylon. It is a very different mode of action. And then a, a, a bacteria, which means the fungus ant larva have to eat it, is the uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, sold as natural. And this is the one that the organic growers can use. And it's very important to use this before the fungus ant populations build up because it's more active on the first instars than the later instars. But it does provide you with a, quote, non-neonicotinoid uh, alternative. Okay, now, stepping back, really what's been redundant, and I was making that case purposely, is that many of these materials are contact, which means thorough cover draw plant parts, uh, frequency of applications, which leads to the fact that if you don't watch it or you don't rotate modes of action, you can get resistant populations developing. So what I put together in this image uh, is just some examples of rotation programs, and these are what we call eight-week rotation programs. That is, you're using the one mode of action for two weeks. One You spray one week and the next week, and then you switch to another different mode of action. And this allows you to avoid the prospects of resistance. Um, and that was sort of the thing about the neonicotinoids. You made one application, you got eight to 12 weeks residual, and by that point, the crop was gone. So you really didn't have to make as many applications if compared if you're going to get off the neonicotinoids. And that's something to really sit down and consider is, okay, if you do that, and that's your prerogative, is you're going to have to be a little more in tuned to rotating products with different modes of action. And I've been working this for many years. We have information out there. Uh, there's a website or a publication we put out on this. And if you'd uh, like more information, you can email me afterward or call me. But you can see that when you look at, for example, the aphids would be Endeavor, which is a selective feeding blocker, and Peed, which is a soap, uh, Contos, the lipid biosynthesis inhibitor, and stuff oil, X and oil. Very discrete modes of action that would minimize the prospects of resistance because many of these insects uh, have very short life cycles, developmental times, and in a greenhouse, when you're making uh, multiple applications and there's many generations occurring, it really exasperates the prospects of resistance becoming a problem. So again, um, sit down and look at these products and make sure that you're not using uh, the same mode of action in succession. All right, we've got a quick question uh, from yeah. uh, Devron. He's asking about uh, Expire. Uh, is it an IRAC 4? And if so, how is it a substitute if it's uh, similar to the uh, the mode of action of a neonic? Excellent question. Now, when you look at the IRAC designations, you don't you just can't look at the number, but you have to look at the letter behind it. And the neonicotinoids are 4A. So Foxifer is a 4C. So it's it's not truly a neonicotinoid in the sense that the others are. It's a little bit different, both structurally and molecularly, than uh, the true neonicotinoids are. And that, that minor difference is enough to, uh, to uh, help you avoid resistance then? Well, I'm going to say at this point, yes. Um, I have some concerns about that, but uh, Dow AgroSciences has said and uh, put out publications that it is not a neonicotinoid. I've read the literature, and I, I think they have a strong case for that. All right. So here we are with aphids again. Of course, fungus nets, you can go biologicals or the IGR is no problem there. So, you know, when, if you're going to get away from the neonics and either use non-neonics or do biologicals, which is another great alternative, um, you have to be cognizant that there's going to be a shift in your mindset and plant protection strategies and that you're going to have to be cognizant of scouting um, because you're, you just don't have the neonicotinoid in the plant, and all of a sudden you can walk away for 8 to 12 weeks. This is going to go back to the fundamentals of uh, IPM or I integrated pest management. You're going to have to be out there scouting more, sanitation, those things. So just be cognizant of that, okay? You know, when you look at this, it, it's, it's not the end of the world, and who knows what's going to happen, but we do have some systemic insecticides that are not neonicotinoid related. Uh, Endeavor and Aria are selective eating blockers, and the reason they have an asterisk is because they have the same mode of action. Uh, Contos is another systemic. Orthene is a systemic. Expire is a systemic. And Sofoxifer is the uh, active that's providing the systemic activity. 
and then uh, Sinetropanol is mainspring, and it's another systemic. So if you go away from the neonicotinoid systemic activity, there are still some materials out there that do have systemic activity. However, they don't always have the same spectrum activity, and they don't always provide the same residual activity as the neonicotinoids would. Which, so, what are some of the issues? Well, one of them is the next image, and that is water solubility. When you look at this chart, the ones in green are the neonicotinoids. And basically, any insecticide that's going to be systemic has to have some level of water solubility. That's why you'll never see a pyrethroid as a systemic because it's lipophilic. Most of them are fairly water soluble. The other ones are less water soluble, other than orthene, which is the most water soluble material that I've ever worked with and seen. But what this transcends, and what you really have to remember is that you have to get these into the plant earlier, in most cases, than you would with a neonicotinoid because of the water solubility. That would say about a month earlier, especially when you look at Contos and Endeavor, um, very low water solubility. So this, what this does, it changes the timing of application. You need to get it into the plant earlier so when the insects are present or feeding, they will be subject or they will be withdrawing concentrations of the active ingredient and, of course, which you want to be killed. Okay, I want to just uh, reinforce, sort of summarize again. Um, we do have, uh, if you go away from neonics, you have alternatives to go in biological control, which is a sound strategy. And we have some non-neonics that you can go with. Some of them are systemic. But be aware of these points, that many of them do not have the same level of spectrum activity as the that the uh, neonics do, neonicotinoids do. Um, they have a, they have a residual activity is going to be a little less. The water solubility is lower, which means you're going to have to apply them earlier on than you normally would. And so these are some of the uh, options and issues you uh, have. Um, and of course, the key thing is get educated and read as much as you can about these materials so that you can use them appropriately um, when dealing with insect pests. So with that, Chris, I'd like to thank the audience, and I am done with my portion of this webinar. Excellent, Dr. Ray. We don't have any more questions right now, but if anybody does, you can type them in, or uh, as we say, you'll be able to contact Ray afterwards. We'll provide his uh, email address for you. We've got the, uh, the academic uh, view of what's available. Now let's talk to a real-world grower, Renato Zardo, to find out how he has implemented all of this at Green Circle Growers. Take it away, Renato. All right, Chris, thank you. So we're going to try to show why and how Green Circle eliminated Neonic. Well, first of all, why? Our biggest retail customer requested us to don't do neonics anymore, and after that they came back and they say, okay, you can do it, but put a tag on it. So we were wondering, if we do the tag, will the customer still buy? And also, for who, those who know us, we are Green Circle Growers and Express Seed. So we sell plugs through Express Seed, and we have way too many clients. Some of them could accept neonics, some of them no. So we decide, okay, no neonics anymore at Green Circle. So what would be, would be the challenges of that? Besides everything that Dr. Ray Cloyd already told us, we had the issue that at Green Circle, at some point, 100% of our plants were getting neonics. Well, why? Because it provides a great, great control and a long residual against fungus gnats, strips, white fly, and aphids one of the major pests that we have on the industry. It's safe for people. The re-entry issue was okay. It's good for the environment. So that was our to go. Everything at Green Circle was great getting neonics. Plus, if you end up with an issue in the end of the crop cycle and with aphid strips, you could go back and spray neonics on the plants with full bloom and you have zero phytotoxicity. So it was a very safe chemical to work with. Okay, when did we decide to do that? Well, in 1995, when they released Marathon, was when we started really working with poinsettias because then we were able to grow poinsettias without whitefly issues. 
And then we decide, okay, if we are able to make through point status this one without unique, we are able to make the other crop. And we did it. So our goal is being 2015, 100% of the plants living green circle growers will be neonic free. Okay, how would we do that? Well, if there is a will, there is a way. If one hand, 100% of our plants were getting neonic, on the other hand, all our major crops we had done one, a full, one full crop cycle with a biological control. So we knew which main biologicals we need to work with, how to work with them, and also we had a long list of safe chemicals that we could use with biologicals. We also did a lot of homework. We did a lot of trials trying to figure out which chemical was able to replace neonic on full bloom without giving phytotoxicity. And we did study a lot. As Dr. Roy, Roy said, we went back to science and we were reading papers, articles, seeing the reports from Dr. Kanas, Ohio State University, Dr. Cloyd, IRR4 reports. And we built a very big data about chemical efficiency to the crops that we work with. We also had to put some money in. We bought a machine, a fogger, that we use in conjunction to a tractor, so it's a track fogger. And this fogger we use at Green Circle once a week, provides us a great coverage. The beauty of the fogger is allows you to do tank mix. We are currently using three products on the fogger per time and reduce, does not eliminate, reduce the chance of phytotoxicity because you can you can apply at night, there's no buyer on the range. We also went back to the basics, as Dr. Clyde said. We started doing a better APM. We were starting clean, we we're sanitizing better our floors. And if you come to Green Circle Growers today, you're gonna see that every single house we have those yellow massive streak traps. And those, they are very good to help us don't let the population to establish. The idea is to trap the adults so you have no eggs on the next generation. So the concept behind is, for instance, for each fungus net adult that we get on the yellow massive stripe, stick trap, you're gonna avoid 200 eggs from fungus net. For each short fly adult, you're gonna avoid, for each female that you get, 300 eggs of short fly. For each female trip that you get on a massive trap, you're gonna avoid 125 on other trips. And for white fly, for each female adult, another 90 eggs. So this year, in our Primula that we grow in our MX, we put the massive, tripe, uh, massive traps all over the poles, and we estimated that we got close to 270,000 short fly or fungus nets, we didn't differentiate those, per house. And our control of short fly fungus net on Primulus this year was great. We didn't have any issue. Okay, so now what are the crops that are neonic free at Green Circle Growers up to today? Well, we did poinsettias last year. We did our lilies and hydrangeas this year. This year. Um, all plugs and liners, and so far our spring crop. So how are we doing that? We have a lot of information here, so let's go little by little. As I said before, all, all crops at Green Circle were getting neonic, and our choice was safari. Safe chemical, systemic, very good control. So for our spring crop, for instead and also mums, as soon as we set those down, we were doing a safari drainage. Okay, what about now? So let's see the first square on top. Our set down on week one, we are doing a natural drainage at 20 ounces per 100 gallon, and that's for fungus net. Now, one thing you gotta keep in mind, if you're using natural, keep in mind, as Dr. Freud said, is a bacteria. So if you have a copper system on your water, you're gonna kill the bacteria of natural. So make sure you use either city water or well water, 
water without copper on it. On week number two, we, we were doing, we are doing a avid eight ounces conserve technique spraying overhead of the plant. Why those chemistry? Well, avid at eight ounces will cover for white flies, thrips, all stage of mites, also broad mites. Conserve will give us a good control of thrips, a little bit of short flies, and at that high rate also control mites. Well, but some people will ask me, okay, what about the resistance of conserve if you're going to be spraying that on everything you set down? That's, that's a very good concern, very good question. That's why we're tank mixing with Avid, and also that's why we are increasing our rate. So, you, and you're gonna see all the other chemistry that we are also using. So you're gonna ask me, okay, Renato, you are spraying three different pesticides instead of one neonic. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. We are doing natural, Avid conserve, but doing those three chemicals together is it still cheaper than doing the safari drench that we were doing before? We are actually saving $145 per application when we switch safari by these three combinations. Okay, and after that? Well, Dr. Claude, he emphasized losing the neonics, we're gonna lose the residual. You can use IGRs, but then you have to be consistent. You have to be proactive. That is what we are doing. So follow me first on the left square, where we have over there, week 1, 6, 11, 16, 21. So this square here is the rotation that we are doing at Green Circle Growers today. It's divided by week, a rotation of five weeks, and each one of those five weeks, we have Botanic Guard and Match 52, two biological insecticides, plus one insecticide. So on week 1, 6, 11, we have area, Botanic Guard, Match 52, for aphids, white fly, mealy bugs, and trees. On week two, we go for Botanic Guard, Match 52, and then we add Instar for white fly and fungus net. On week three, week eight, 13, 15, 23, we're going to be doing Botanic Guard, Match 52, and Overture for trees. On the next week, week four, we're going to be doing Botanic Guard, Match 52, as a guard, as a directing, either or. And on the last week of the rotation, is Botanic Guard, Match 52, and Pedestal on top of that. That's why we are not concerned with resistance to conserve because we have different insecticides with different mode of action. Now, please notice that Anstar, Azaguard, or Azetin, and Pedestal, they are IGRs, insect growth regulators. So it's not a knock knockdown effect, as you see on Safari, for instance. That's why you have to be proactive. You have to be that's why we're spraying weekly. We are starting clean to stay clean. If you don't start clean, you don't stay, you don't stay clean. Now, is that a 100% bulletproof system? Check for phytotoxicity first. So far, we have been very good at Green Circle. In our trials, we have seen, for instance, on hydrangea full bloom, we had phytotoxicity on pink hydrangeas. We have seen something on plugs. So trial first, okay? Well, poinsettias, how did we do? So here we have what we used on poinsettias in 2013 and 2014. So follow me over here on the left side in 2013. We were doing a safari drench for fungus net, white fly, and short fly. We were using nematodes for fungus net, short fly. We were using citation in some areas, not all, mostly on the plug stage. We also had matrix situ and botanic guard. BCA is the biological control agent as predatory mites for trips and white fly and the parasite wasp for white fly. Now, in 2014, we took all the chemicals out, so our poinsettia was 100% biological. We only use nematodes for short fly fungus nets, and we use biological control agents for white fly and trips. And our approach was very dif different from the year before different how the rates that we use. Working with copper, we use like 10 times more the number of biological control agents that we used to use. I was a little scared when we we started doing that, but it works phenomenal. We were walking to the greenhouse, we could see wasps, beneficial wasps flying all over the place. 
and how was the control? So before we get into the chart here, just follow me on the top. Last year we released up to 19 million of beneficial was at Green Circle only during the poinsettia season. And believe it or not, that was more profitable than the year before because a lot of things involved. We didn't have the issue of re-entry anymore. A safari was very expensive. Citation was very expensive. And we are able to be very clean and green on control without pass. So if you follow me on this chart over here, on your left side, from 0 to 10, you have the number of white fly in black or trips in red. Going from 0 to 10, that we count on our cards weekly. And on top, you will see on the orange square that we were releasing Encarcia and Erotromosterus as our biological wasps every single week. And if you follow the count of trips on black, you will see that the maximum, I'm sorry, from white flies, the maximum of white flies that we got per card was four. And our number of trips are very, very low as well. So we succeed on poinsettias with a biological control. Renato, quick question, uh, 19 yeah. million wasps. How many acres of greenhouse was that spread across? Just so people could maybe do the math for their own facility. Uh, over 30 acres, easy. Okay, 19 million for 30 acres. We can work the math on that one. Okay, next slide now. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, Easter lilies. So we, let's compare how we did in 2013 when we were using Marathon, which is the new NIC as an initial range. On your left side, from zero to 60, the number of fungus nets per card and our counts weekly. You can see on the yellow line that the fungus nets, they did went down from an average of 50 to 20 after the marathon range. But they went back up and we finished on average of 35 fungus nets per card. Chris? So now here in 2015, follow me over there on the left side from zero to five to four and our average of fungus nets was only two and a half. So how we drop from 35 to two and a half fungus nets per card? Well, follow me over there on the orange squares where we see what did we do. We started with the massive yellow stick traps as I was showing before, before we put the crop on the ground. And then we did a natural drench right on the beginning. As Dr. Cloyd said, natural is a bacteria and biological, so you have to do that early as a preventative, not as a curative. That's what we did. And you see our fungus net number, it never went high. Our average was 2.5. So we're talking from 35 fungus nets per card down to 2.5 fungus nets per card. Hydrangeas, that's a new slide. We just finished hydrangea last week, so that's why I want to include this one here. So 2013, Again, our first range was a marathon, marathon sprint. It did work for three weeks, and after like January 15, you can see our fungus net went high, 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 up to 45. We also had some trips issues. They got up to 22 per card, and then we started doing microtrol. So we got up to 45 fungus nets per card and more than 20 trips per card. Now, in 2015, we have the maximum two and a half fungus nets per card and no trips at all. Okay, how did we do that? Once again, 20th of January, very first day, massive traps on the house, and then we start fogging with Botanic Guard and Match 52, and we start doing that spring rotation that I mentioned before. Can you go back to that rotation, Chris? Keep going back, keep going back. Go back, go back, go back, go back, there we go. So, oh, that one. Oh, there, that's one. So that was the rotation that we we were doing in our our hydrangea crop. That rotation is the ideal one for green circle. Why for green circle? You might gonna ask me why we don't have contours over there. Why you don't have distance over there? Well, the reason why is phytotoxicity. We have seen phytotoxicity of contours on geranium. Distance can also bring some phytotoxicity. So at green circle we have like five, six, seven, up to 10 different crops per bay. 
So we cannot afford, for instance, oh, on Petunias we're going to be doing Overture, but here on the, on the Geranium we have to skip Overture because of Phyto or vice versa. Every, one decision for all the crops. That, that rotation is also good for us because Anstar, Azetine, they have a four hours re-entry along with the biologicals. We could have the option of you still using systemic like Ortin or Mesuro, but we, at Green Circle, we cannot afford a 48, 48 hours or 24 hours reentry. We are planting plants every day. We are spacing plants every day. We are shipping plants every single day of the year. So we cannot afford hold labor to do it the reentry time. Plus, all one of those five chemistry here, Area, Anstar, Overture, as a team in pedestal, they are soft on beneficial. So we are also using that rotation on our main crops where we do biologicals only, for instance, on Gerbera. Okay, Chris, let's go back. So what can we use if we are replacing neonics? Well, Renato, we don't have a track fog, so we have to do a boom spray, a hydraulic spray. What would you suggest? Well, for fungus nets, we have natural. As I said, be careful if you have copper on your water. Citation, adapt, distance, and answer. For trips, area, avid, pylon, conserve, overture, and pedestal. Uh, if you're looking for a knockdown, avid, pylon, and conserve. Be careful with phytotoxicity of avid and pylon on flowers. Conserve, you can get on resistance, so just make like a rotation. You can use, for instance, from Dr. Cloyd. Uh, Overture is a pretty good chemical, but you're going to see the control one week after your application and be careful with residue. You can have some white residue on it. Pedestal is an IGR, so you're not seeing the control right away. It's like one week to 15 days. Area also provides a good control. AFIPs, that's where I put a question mark. Why? Well, as Dr. Cloyd said, Area and Endeavor, they are the same mode of action. And those two, they are safe on flowers, they provide a good control, so that's my biggest concern. We also have contos in which we can use depending on the crop, but we cannot use overall because of phytotoxicity. Whitefly, Area gives you a good control. Sirocco, we start using right now, I'm not very familiar, but it does provide some good control. Judo is pretty good, but you get applied more than one time. Endeavor is also good, Ponto is good. Semite, a good thing about Semite is we have applied on poinsettia bract and we haven't seen anything and does control, haven't seen anything as phytotoxicity and does control whitefly. And leaf minor, we have avid, pedestal, and also precision. We've got one quick question here, uh, Renato, from uh, Jay oh. Llewellyn. Wants to know, wouldn't bio controls at this higher rate, 19 million, uh, be more expensive than just one neonic uh, drench or application? But I that's think you kind of answered that question, didn't you? Yes, but that's a great question because everybody asks, okay, bios are kind of expensive, aren't they? Yes, they are. And you have to know how to work with them because they are alive. If they are alive, you can kill them if you forget to apply or on shipment. You gotta know how to work with bios. Uh, to answer his question, if he's asking if that amount of bios is more expensive than one application, for sure. But throughout the crop cycle, when we put side by side the poinsettias 2012, 13 against the cost of 2014, 2014 was way cheaper. One more thing besides cost of bios against chemistry that you have to put on paper, the reentry time. You don't have to buy suits anymore. You don't have to buy masks anymore. You don't have to buy boots or gloves anymore for application. Plus, it's much safe on phytotoxicity. You don't end up getting the plant sweat, so then you have to go back to a fungicide to avoid botrytis. You have to put everything on the equation. It's also very safe to our people. Our workers, they love it. And we were comparing uh, labor time. For one guy that was applying the year before, uh, we were doing Botanic Garden Mat 52 by Hydraulic Sprayer, and this year was only the wasps. It was taking for him the same time to do the biological on a full range, the time that was taken to him to spray a full house, and a full range is like 10 houses. So we are saving on labor as well. And I'm sure that was probably a surprise to, to you and the folks at Green Circle. 
It was. It was because when we set up the rate, I said, oh boy, it will be very expensive. But after we put everything on paper and we start tracking every single thing, we were very surprised and we were very, very happy about it. Okay, All that right. was what I had to bring up today. If you have any questions, you feel free to email me or shoot us anything. We'd be more than happy to help you. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go right into our next grower, Tom Wheeler, who um, not only is uh, like Renato, he's got a year, at least a year of experience in uh, growing neonic free, but he and, and the folks at Bell Nursery have decided to keep using <laughs> neonics, at least for the foreseeable future. So, Tom, take it away. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, thanks, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, wow. It's um, Great to hear such good presentations with uh, the science from Joe and, and uh, Raymond and, uh, and then the growing experience with uh, Renato. So I'm basically going to tell the story of Bell. I've been asked to talk about it, um, why and how we went away from Neonix in 2014 and uh, what our plans are for 2015. So with that, let me start with a little bit of history. Um, in our poinsettia crops back in 2010, 2011, we started seeing some what we perceived as a resistance in, in uh, the white fly populations we were encountering um, coincided with the Q biotype that we all we heard so much about coming in, you know, up into our region at the time. So um, prior to that, we were pretty much using a neonic, uh, either a 1G um, uh, application to the soil surface or a, or 60WP with it, with imidacloprid primarily. We started moving away from, from imidacloprid and the neonics in general in 2010, 2011. And what we came up with was a, uh, as an effective strategy was um, soon after the pinch, we went in and we put a, a uh, distance sprench to the soil surface. And um, we, we thought that was a good alternative uh, for white fly, fungus, gnat, shore fly. Soon after the pinch, you, you oftentimes are uh, your one of your concerns is, is getting the the media too wet, um, taking off all the vegetative growth. So um, the challenge may be fungus net and shore fly at that point in time. So distance made sense to us from that standpoint, and we were also getting some white fly control. So we went in there right after the pinch, soon after the pinch, with a distance branch, four ounces per 100 gallons. And you really need to pay attention to the uh, the, the rate and volume with uh, distance, as we you can see some phytotoxicity um, if you're over apply it. Um, we then went in um, once we got into early September when the plants started flushing a little bit of growth with a contos drench as our primary systemic, uh, anticipating four to six weeks of control out of that, um, and and basically we're figuring that we would have to. Uh, scout rigorously, you know, throughout the crop, or primarily uh, in mid-October, early mid-October, to see if we had um, some white fly increases. In which case, we may need to do a, a reapplication. Whereas the neonicotinoid uh, that we had been using prior, we would we were anticipating about 12 weeks of control, basically getting us to the sale season. So um, this season. Uh, we can say that we were successful with the distance and contos French. We've been using that now for two to three years as our as our uh, poinsettia strategy, and so we've basically been neonic free in our poinsettia since 2011 2012 timeframe, uh, which leads us into spring of 2013. Again, we 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 perceived that we were encountering more and more um, resistance resistant populations of, of uh, several of the soft-bodied insects, um, aphids and white fly primarily. Um, and so we were uh, looking for alternatives basically in 2013 in the spring out of, uh, res you know, continuation of our poinsettia uh, strategy. So I was prodding our, our growers and all of our production hubs to move away from the mode of action for A chemicals uh, due to resistant concerns, primarily aphid and white fly, primarily aphids during the spring, obviously. Um, and so, as at, at Bell Nursery, Maryland is is sort of our laboratory, if you will, for trying new product, uh, including chemicals, plant products, so forth. But we once we feel comfortable, we roll it out to all our production hubs. So in 2013, we were we were um, fairly uh, pretty much neonic free in Maryland, and we were 
moving that direction in all of our other production hubs in Ohio, North Carolina, and Virginia, Delaware. Um, which brings us to, to June of 2013, and uh, we had the Oregon incident, which, which basically launched this whole uh, subject into the limelight, uh, got into the media with the activists, demonstrations, uh, and we had a lot of debate within the industry, uh, particularly um, the big boxes. I know we're talking about a lot about a lot about it. Home Depot, Lowe's, um, internally here at Bell, was a very very um, big topic we were talking about. So while we continued near Nick Free in the point setters of 2013, um, we were talking about the potential because of it being such an emotional subject, um, being out there in the media in the way that it was. Uh, we we thought that it was a real chance that their right or wrong could be a neonic ban, um, so we thought we needed to be prepared. Uh, next slide, Chris. So in spring of 2014, we challenged ourselves here in Bell um, to go neonic free to see what the challenges were. Um, we we still maintain that neonics were among the safest class of uh, chemicals out there. Um, we're totally behind following the science, and um, but we definitely wanted to be prepared, to, and in case the ban came down the pipelines, and um, this was definitely a, an internal experiment. We didn't intend it for public information, um, but basically to learn the challenges and be prepared. Uh, in my in my view, um, from a production standpoint, the biggest challenge was the baskets that we put up in the canopy. Uh, if they if their residency on your benches is three to four weeks prior to hanging, uh, you want to get some type of assist protection on those on that product before you get it up in the canopy, where it's it's much more difficult to treat. Obviously, um, I mean fogging is is one of your options, but it's it's really not as effective as a wet spray. So we decided that we would look for alternatives, and in 2014, our primary alternative became uh, Contos. So we were using Contos at uh, 1.7 ounces per 100-gallon rate. Uh, we were putting it on probably at two to three weeks after transplant and had it in the, in the basket or, or the large container before it went into the canopy or got spaced out. Um, Contos has several restrictions on the label. Um, we definitely recommend becoming very familiar with all the labels, especially of the newer products. Um, geranium phytoxic, phytotoxicity is, is warned against on the on the contest labels specifically, uh, as well as a few other uh, items that we don't typically produce in the spring here in Maryland or in any of our other hubs, but are mainly southern, uh, deep south items, Dracaena, Cordyline, Schifflera, Palms, Ferns. Um, but geraniums are specifically warned against. and uh, we also learned that there's a delay in verbena flowering with uh, ver with uh, contest applications. So we learned we learned that right out of the gate that that with our fewer systemic alternatives at the time in 2014, contest being the primary alternative, there was definitely limitations. Uh, geraniums are a key component of what we produce, and what most folks produce is either a uh, monocrop or as a component in a combination, and so that limits it there. Uh, so we were using much more, uh, many more spray applications, foliar applications, particularly with drains and verbena. So as, as, the, as the time went along in, this, in the um, summer and fall of 2014, there were some new products coming down the pipeline. Um, next slide, Chris. Um, so again, back to the, by, back to the contos, uh, our primary systemic alternatives, not on not on geraniums, not on verbena, uh, used as systemic or uh, drench or spray. Um, we like to use it more as a more as a drench. Um, some of the attributes of contos were pointed out in, in Dr. Cluwood's, um presentation, in particular, it's uh, it's much less mobile than the neonix, so it's slower acting. You you've got to get it on the crop earlier, um, and uh, you have the limitation of geraniums and, and verbena, and there's other li limitations on the label, specifically uh, addressing pollinators. So please go on there and read the label, become familiar with the label of all the alternatives, and look for, look for uh, information specifically related to pollinator safety. And this is a picture of uh, of a geranium phytotoxicity 
at the 1.7 ounce rate uh, drench. You can see there that in the new growth you have uh, bleached out foliage and it will actually go necrotic um, after another week or two from this point. Um, so um, follow the directions, don't use don't use contest on geraniums and be warned against it on verbena. If you have a timetable or schedule that you're trying to meet, I uh, would look for an alternative than contest with verbena. There's a picture of the verbena. Um, the florets will get to that point and then they'll just stay there and uh, take take their sweet time opening up and you'll have, you'll have a, from this point in time, you could have two to three weeks before it opens into full color. Um, next slide. So some of the challenges that we, we've learned about um, in our spring crops in particular are, and we have, uh, without the neonicotinoids, is there's uh, several more spray applications and increased worker exposure. Um, Renato touched on a few of these. Um, managing the REI, we're all shipping and working in the greenhouse every day. So if you're doing more spray applications, you obviously have to, uh, from a worker protection standard standpoint, it's a, a increased management um, concern. Reduced options um, as far as resistance management, um, that's one of my primary concerns is that with the with fewer systemic options that we go down the road that we went with conserve, conserve when it came on the market was very effective, but it was basically overused um, by the in the industry. It became relatively ineffective where we are today, and uh, so that that is one of the big concerns that I have with the few systemic alternatives we have today with the contos and the mainspring as far as the soil drench um, goes. So, with those options, we still we still encountered. Um, tough to control populations of aphids, particularly in, in some pepper plants and so forth, whereas before we may come in with a, a Marathon 2, a metaclopid of some type, uh, we were using Endeavor or a soap or a neem product um, where we got decent control, and uh, but we have phytotoxicity concerns, longevity concerns, um, learning the nuances of the, of the newer chemicals. So we have a new product come on the market like we have Rycar and Expire, uh, so in some of the alternatives, that requires a learning curve. You can't just go out there and put it on your crop, you know, across all your crops without um, testing it. So there's a, there's a learning curve there. And you will come across some phyto challenges or some longevity challenges or some resistant challenges. So many of these things Dr. Cloyd, um has touched upon, as did Renato. So um, these are just some of the ones that we saw in Bell. Next slide. Okay, so resistance management, um, we basically try to rotate to a new class, a new mode of action on a successive generation. So in our, in our mind, that's a rule of thumb we follow is about 21 days for most of your insecticide classes, uh, depending on um, how frequently you're spraying, your level of pressure. And you may be spraying at a seven day interval, you may be spraying at a 10 to 14 day interval, but after 21 days, you need to move on to a new new class. Um, so definitely target the most susceptible life stages. And look at this new lineup of products that we've got that came onto the market in the summer, fall of 2014. Uh, Mainspring, uh, Mode of Action 28, and Contos, a Mode of Action 23, will be Bell Nursery's uh, primary systemic alternative, uh, Mainspring being new to us and uh, for a spring crop, um, we it's we've been utilizing it to this point so far this year on all of our geranium products that have, you know, in our basket line. So mainspring and contos out of that lineup are our primary systemics. This slide here is basically a statement of Bell's position. Um, I don't, I won't necessarily read, read it to you, um, but uh, basically saying that we follow a rigorous, you know, IPM program that we're going to follow the science. Um, in the last 10 years, we've basically reduced our, our chemical usage by 70%, primarily through uh, rigorous IPM and, in conjunction with neonicotinoid use. So um, 
we think the neonicotinoid class in conjunction with IPM is the way to go. Uh, we definitely will follow the science, and um, that's basically what it's saying. It's saying that we we're going to go out there and, and put put neonics back in the back in the toolbox in 2015 because we think they deserve to be there. The the experiment we did in 2014, we learned quite a bit. Uh, we think that it can be done with many more challenges, and um, so that's where we'll be in 2015. Next slide. And Tom, I'll just inter interject here that uh, I'm glad you put this in. I think all the attendees can uh, can use this if they feel like they need a position statement for their company's position. This is a good one. It's it's carefully thought out, carefully written. So uh, you can always refer back to this webinar once it's archived if you want to uh, uh, copy that or jot it down. Or I'm sure they could email you and you just send them this uh, this slide or the note. So absolutely. Uh, and th the next two or three slides are basically. Um, um, related to bee population decline and some of the facts that are actually facts that are out there. Um, Joe touched on quite a few of these points um, as to the what are the main factors that actually do factually contribute to bee decline or CCD. Um, you can move through these pretty quick. Uh, the, third, uh, the third of these, the next one, is the one that I really like to point out in my mind um, in talking about bee decline. Is basically a, pra a real world, uh, a real one of the real world examples that sticks out to me that um, supports neonicotinoid use is the Australia example where the neonicotinoid usage has been steady or on the increase. Um, their bee colonies are um, steady or increasing, and it's the only it's the, the only continent on the planet where veromite is not uh, hasn't been introduced. So that to me um, is a very you know telling statement about veromite, and then the related um, things that happen when you have when the beekeepers and the colony colony keepers have a veromite, and the, uh, what they may do, the pesticides they might introduce, the fungicides they may introduce that are contributing to bee decline um, with a steady and uh, steady usage of neonicotinoids in, in Australia. And a steady bee population, it's it's pretty telling. So any any product that comes uh, out of Bell and and suppliers for the Home Depot um, will have this a uh, tag uh, in the in the pot. So this this tag to me is um, um, is a great is a great positive spin that um, the Home Depot has put on it. It shows I, I believe it shows leadership by the Home Depot while putting a positive spin in a science based. So while looking out for the consumer, um, it's letting the consumer know these were treated with neonicotinoids, and it even gives a, um, a website for the consumer to go to learn more and uh, read about the science of neonicotinoids, B decline, and it's a good wealth of information there. And Tom, one of the questions we got the last time we did this webinar was, uh, did you think that the, the tag would have a negative uh, impact or effect on uh, customer shopping for plants. Tell them, tell them what you think and what we've heard. Yeah. Um, well, we did a Chris and I were together on a on a, a on a panel, a seminar discussion on neonicotinoids about two or three weeks ago, and we talked about this. And one, and there were several retailers involved in it, and um, several of them came up after the panel discussion was finished and said that uh, they weren't so sure that a tag such as this would not increase the value of the plant, that it wouldn't be perceived by the customer as something that would increase the value, that a customer would come in, see this tag there, and perhaps uh, prefer to buy the product that had been treated with a neonicotinoid. So we thought that was pretty um, interesting. Was this was this tag developed internally at Home Depot or with a panel of growers? Where did it come from? Somebody's asking that question. Yeah, well, uh, quite a bit of discussion and back and forth with within this within the industry, but it was primarily within the Home Depot. I know some people would like to see a big red slash and a nuclear bomb that this plant is, is you know, uh, deadly and things like that, but I guess there's a lot of different ways you could have done it, so. So in 2015, um, we're going to put the new NIC class back into our toolbox as an option, as needed. I don't see us using them widespread, nor, nor had we previously. Um, that's why I gave the history to, to start out the talk. Um, 
I think it's the responsibility of all of us in, you know, in the grower community to rotate responsibly and uh, don't overuse any class of chemicals. Neonics ought to be in the toolbox um, and we're going to put them back in the toolbox and we're going to continue to follow the science. Um, our primary systemic alternatives will continue to be compost and maiden spring. Um, both of those have a few limitations that have been discussed by you know, myself and uh, Dr. Cloyd and, and Renato. Um, but we'll, we'll also continue to explore any alternatives that come down the pipeline. Um, next slide. And keys to success, I think we've all mentioned these. Start clean, um, an aggressive IPM program, scout, scout aggressively, um, have in place a strong uh, rotation strategy, several of which were touched on and put uh, presented here by Dr. Cloyd and uh, Renato. Um, Definitely become familiar and get in the habit of reading the uh, the label through. Um, I like to take my growers in our weekly meeting with our section growers and and uh, hi take a highlighter and highlight different parts of the label that you want to pay particular attention to. Fun science and research around pollinator stewardship. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the sites where you can do that. Um, which, which I think all of us have a responsibility to do, to educate ourselves and to follow the science. Um, go onto these websites, see where you can contribute, whether it be financially or writing letters or supporting them in any way you can. So that's, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Excellent, Tom. Now, uh, we do have a few questions here that could kind of be for any of our, um, our experts. Let me start here. This one may be for, uh, for Dr. Ray. Dr. Ray, you still there? I'm still here. All right, let's see. John wants to know, uh, I'm going to read this one to you. Because neonics have such a long residual activity, they create 100% selection pressure on the crops they're applied to with a tapering effect at the end. Should additional chemicals be applied to a seemingly clean crop to break resistance? I don't quite understand that question, but maybe you will. Well, I think it's, I think it's a valid question, and it's always been one when we talk about systemics, is that the, the populations that are there are exposed to that, that, that one mode of action uh, for a long period of time. However, you know, in a greenhouse, you're, you're, you know, all these multiple generations are occurring, and so you are going to have um, – of substantial exposure to one mode of action. However, um, the issue isn't so much systemics as, as a systemic, but more when they're applied foliarly that you get those issues. But to try to address the question is, yes, there is a prospects of the ones that are remaining uh, could be resistant, although I don't think I've seen documentation on that, but it might be out there. Um, but when you get high kill, uh, the use of systemics is almost what we call the 100% kill them all. That is, you get it in there and you want to kill every bug, and so you minimize the prospects of both selection pressure and resistance. So that's the other uh, hypothesis there. So, but, but in terms of applying something else, um, it's, based on, it's going to be based on the populations of insects that are there. So if you've got, uh, say, low numbers, uh, then there's no really need to spray. And if you do spray, it's very obvious you don't want to go in with another neonicotinoid. All right, very good. Now, here's a question uh, for Renato from Clayton about foggers in general. Uh, wants to know if you could fog, um, use a fogger for both uh, fungicides and insecticides. Um, he's got a retail garden center and has never used one. Wants to know if you can treat both things. Could you do it together? Is it worth it for a retail situation? In other words, he'd love to be able to do a tank mix of a fungicide and an insecticide, set it off using a fogger in his garden center at night, and uh, kind of be done with it. What do you think, Renato? Um, good question. As preventative, yes. We have done here, along with our insecticides, Actinovate, and it was okay. But, for instance, for our inpatient, inpatient down the middle rotation, we are doing a wet spray, not by fogger. We just feel more comfortable with a better coverage to get a translamine activity. I did ask to a professor at Ohio State University, and her answer was, still a wet spray will give you a better coverage for disease than the fogger. So that's what we are doing. We're mainly using our, our fogger for insects, but you also can use for disease, but as preventative, not curative. 
Yeah, as a, as a tool, foggers certainly are a great way to apply uh, uh, chemicals, both from an e efficacy standpoint and a worker safety standpoint, I think, right? That's correct, that's correct. Also, if you see in the rotation, I don't have any mite side beside, besides match 52 done by fogger. As mite side, we have had some issues with mites last year, and we fog with, my, with, with shadow O for mites, and we kill all the mites on top of the plants, but the mites, they like to stay, they like to stay on the other side of the leaves, and we didn't reach those doing by the fogger. Maybe because we need some more air exchange, some more airflow, but for mites, I still feel more comfortable doing like a wet spray. Gotcha. All right. Uh, question for Dr. Uh, Cloyd from JR. JR says, several of the chemicals that uh, Green Circle, Renato, uh, is using are labeled greenhouse only. Is it possible to develop a similar program for an outdoor nursery of a similar size, presumably big? Uh, is this referring to the chemistry or the biologicals? Uh, well, he says chemicals because they're, he says they're labeled greenhouse only. Um, well, you know, many many of those are, uh, have have labels that are also include shade houses or lath houses or nurseries too. So, um, I, I think if you look if you read the label, um, hint hint, uh, you'll see that some of those on Renato's list and on my list are registered for both indoor and outdoor production systems. So. Um, I know one of them, Pylon, is not registered for outdoors, but a number of them that I presented, as well as Renato, are labeled for nursery production, too. All right. Here's one from Debbie. This is for any of you who'd like to weigh in. How do you start out clean in a greenhouse that's been infested with thrips year after year? I, I have been there a couple of times. Yeah. May I answer the question then? <laughs> Personal experience, Renato. Go for it. Uh, so if you saw our my on my slide where I have the hydrangeas, then we finish with trips when the hydrangeas go into spring in 2013. So how do you start clean? Well, you have to work very hard on that with your people managing management as well and try to hold labor. And once you clean up the greenhouse, what we did we apply zap on everything because what will touch will burn. And then you set plants down. As soon as you set plants down, or even before, put the massive trap around. So you're gonna, and if you wanna include some pheromone on the yellow stick trap, that will also help. So we're gonna get the adults. And once you set your crop down, we before were using Neonic Safari because of the residual, because we know we don't have anything there. We put a plant and trips will go feed on every, everything, anything. So they will go for that plant. So then we're, apply, we're applying Safari. Um, right now, a great one to knock trips down is still pylon. You get to, the, right. so to, to answer your question, sanitation first, and then you go back with a strong chemistry. Sanitation, yeah, I'd like to follow up on that. You know, a lot of t growers I deal with, they will do everything, but they'll get a crop coming in from somebody else, and it'll have thrips, and so all their efforts are wasted. So. Um, if you can, if you can quarantine some plants, put it in yellow sticky cards for a couple of days, uh, that'll help you detect if anything is coming in from the plants you're getting shipped in from somewhere else. So, especially offshore, um, because you know they have a, a, a higher levels of thrips because of the environment. So, you know, it's growers can, growers can remove all weeds. They can do concrete. They can do limestone to the floor, and leave them empty. But as soon as they bring the plants in. Uh, with thrips, you know, it's pretty much over at that point. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for with questions. But if you have more questions, and I've seen a few more out there. In fact, there's, you're getting it pretty in-depth with a couple of them, but, uh, but the, the folks asking have said uh, if it's easier, you can just uh, sort of do it privately. We've got Joe, Renato, Ray, and Tom's email addresses there. So jot those down real quickly. And... Um, I also want to, uh, to tell you that this webinar will be archived at uh, ballpublishing.com slash webinars, so you can uh, refer back to any portions of it. And when you go out there, you can actually scroll ahead, you know, uh, to, to get to particular uh, sections of, the, uh, of any of the four presentations, so you don't have to watch through all of it just to get to the ending if you don't want to. So. And a couple more uh, webinars. I've got one going on tomorrow where um, we're going to be talking about how to overcome PGR overdoses. That's at uh, 1 
Eastern, noon Central tomorrow. And then at the end of the month, March 25th, hydroponic lettuce. That's another one that we're doing, um, doing twice. So that one's coming up as well. So you can sign up for those at uh, ballpublishing.com slash webinars, the same place you find the archive. And lastly, one more special thanks to our sponsor, Ball Seed Company. Thank you, Ball Seed. And uh, with that, for, uh, for Joe, for Ray, for Renato, and for Tom and all the folks at Ball Publishing, this is Chris Bates saying so long, everybody.